Aha. Animal Crossing came out. Yeah, and Doom came out as well, right? I've, I have that on my uh, wish list. Evie bought a puzzle of a thousand pieces, so that's what she's working on. Uh, cool, Kima is not a puzzle person. She gives up so very quickly. That's not a bad thing. Anyway, hey, Quarantinerinos, how are you doing? Um, it is, uh, I'm just gonna start. You know exactly what has basically happened. I don't know what students have received from the administration. Uh, the faculty haven't received much from the administration, come to that. We have such stuff as, um, uh, like we. I read the press releases saying students will find out Wednesday at 4 p.m. the state of their semester, but I never actually got a message directly towards faculty saying, oh, by the way, you are required by this time. So uh, hopefully you've heard from everybody. Hopefully, more importantly, that you are safe and you are sound and that everyone is more or less happy. I'm going to cough. I'm going to be coughing into a microphone so that's even grosser. I'm also, maybe I need to twist this so that I don't have the weird lighting buzzes and stuff. <coughs> Every time I come in and out of shadow, I look moody and mysterious now, which is what people are hoping for from a, from a professor. All right. I sent out the PDF with the, with the PowerPoint slides. And as I said, uh, this video will be up more or less as is. I might crop out some of the me staring at a screen and typing at the very, very beginning if you were to erase this. Uh, but the chat will be part of it. So that can become a sort of ongoing record. Uh, I'm also going to take it and sort of trim it down a little bit. Probably, I don't know whether it would retain the chat, but I'll trim it down and I'm going to add in certain kind of fancy ways the slides as well. So there's the opportunity of basically having um, the uh, so this feed access to it or kind of a more integrated, almost what you would expect were this to be done well ahead of time. Um, I don't know if CBU has the technology to have made this easier. Uh, they certainly weren't forthcoming sharing that technology if we have it. But uh, I'm reasonably adept at this sort of thing, and I will get it to you in a reasonable period of time. And the PowerPoints will be available in like their regular standard PDF form as well. So I, um, I've sent emails to this effect, but I just wanted to cover it in this way. Um, we have such things as... Uh, what the classes are going to be. This, we have five more classes. I mean, if you include today, and we have five more chapters of Andrea's book. So uh, that is how we are going to proceed. Uh, the, maintaining the same schedule, I will be in front of a computer, hopefully on campus, uh, at 2.30 on Mondays and one o'clock on Fridays. This is not gonna go 75 minutes. If it does, someone call security and have them shoot me in the face. Um, hopefully this will only be about 30 or 40 minutes long, absolute maximum. Um, but let's see. Uh, so we'll do this and then this is what we're gonna have for lectures. Uh, the, um, uh, yeah, that's, and that's actually, that's slide number two. All that information is going to be there. I want to talk briefly about the rest of the assignments for the semester. As I said, more or less everything can go as uh, according to plan. We have, um, can, can people hear me? I got the, uh, the, the light seems to be going on okay, but it's on like the second or third. I know I'm not peaking, but if I'm too quiet, let me know and I will project more. I don't, I'm using the internal mic as opposed to an external. Um, uh, the, the exam is going to be exactly the same as the exam you had. We've already spoken about this, but I'll just confirm. It'll be on Moodle and uh, it'll be the, the same format. It'll be at the same time. Uh, the JK, JKC students will have extra time available. And as I said, I grant you three hours and four and a half for JKC students. You don't need that amount of time, but I, I grant it because I grant it. There you go. Hey, volume is good. Hey, Catherine, how's it going? Uh, I'm, I, I don't know if I'm going to be greeting absolutely everyone by name, but if I see a name that I haven't seen already, I might just go, hey, how's it going? So exam is fine. 
Uh, I think the annotation assignment can more or less go as planned. Uh, you can always be emailing me, or I could also set up a forum so that you can have sort of collective conversations about that, because uh, the answer that I give to one person is probably likely going to be the answer I give to another. That being said, I got an email this weekend basically saying, you know, I'm trying to come up with the three sources, and uh, but I'm self-quarantined. I cannot get to the library, and that is completely fair. We have a very weird discipline, uh, folklore in general, contemporary legend doubly so. A lot of the stuff is in obscure places. Contemporary legends of the journal, for example, of which uh, this is a copy. And uh, you don't can't see this, but behind you is basically the entire inventory of uh, contemporary legends. Um, we do not have it easily available online. It's, I have a link somewhere. I'm pretty sure I put it up there. Yeah, it's, it's down on the Moodle page. I have a link to the uh, the first 20 years of it, but it's in the, the MUN archive system. They aren't in sort of sleek journal uh, archive things, not like a JSTOR style or a or an EBSCO style. So they are cumbersome to look through at best. And then that doesn't necessarily encompass things. And things like the, you know, CBU's got rid, in, got rid of some of its electronic books. So we used to have Run Vance Encyclopedia of Urban Legends. We don't have that in the electronic version anymore. I think we used to have Smith and Bennett's uh, Greenwood uh, book, Big Book of Urban Legends, and we don't have that either. So they're just going to be things that you can't have access to. So I am changing yet again, adapting to the, um, asking for two as opposed to three and i am going to be pretty chill about even that criteria i want people to make make best efforts and that's really all i can stress at this point uh there is stuff out there you don't always need to be looking at folklore journals there's one person who is doing something on frivolous lawsuits and and there are some really interesting legal uh, journals out there that talk about frivolous lawsuits and use the word contemporary legend and cite contemporary legend literature in order to do it. So feel free to uh, to do that. But I'm asking for two, and I'm asking you to kind of try, but I'm also aware that we are living through Armageddon, and what the hell are you going to do? So, uh, yeah. Let's get to teaching. I wanted to talk a little bit about the stuff that we weren't able to cover from uh, Andrea's introduction last time. And I want to talk primarily about uh, like the interrelationship between folklore and popular culture. That's slide four for those who, uh, those who are uh, standing by. Um, one of the things that I just want to emphasize, and of course, this is sort of, I mean, in a way, Andrea is covering her bets, but she's making, I think, one of those great articulate arguments that when we talk about folklore, we've already established this, but this is a nice summary of the argument. When we're talking about folklore as a process, we want to remember that the folk, as it were, are Catholic in terms of what they draw their inferences from, what they draw their motifs from. Uh, if you are being intentionally conservative, if you are being intentionally um, self-reflective in terms of what constitutes folklore, that's when you start to isolate these, these issues, where you take folklore and you make it somehow distinct from popular culture uh, and, and turn them into sort of these silos. And uh, that is, that is uh, I'm not going to say elitist, but that is a an expression that doesn't actually, or an understanding of things that doesn't actually uh, take account of what constitutes the actual sort of dynamism of folklore. So this is a really succinct argument in saying that why would a folklorist be interested in this? We draw our inspiration from popular culture as much as we draw it from some sacrosanct, uh, inviolate uh, folk culture. Conversely, popular culture draws, responds to, eh, commercializes, capitalizes on. Um, uh, folk folk belief. So they're on. They're in this constant set of flux. And yes, I think it's important for for that point she makes about being aware that you know there there is this sort of Gramscian thing. This this idea that popular culture can also be used as a form of uh, hegemony. You know, structuring and, and influencing and setting up some uh, some uh, uh, maintaining some kind of message that is ultimately good for institutional culture uh, in terms of economics, in terms of uh, notions of belief, in terms of normative behavior and so on. 
we re we recognize that that is part of it, and that's why you always have to have your complex glasses on. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you dismiss the concepts of it out of hand. You can employ that hermeneutic of suspicion while also employing that hermeneutic of uh, empathy and that uh, uh, hermeneutic of openness to it, because the folk always use what is at their disposal. Remember, as I said, uh, Crossroads, the greatest movie of all time. If I haven't explained that to you, I will explain it at some other moment. So keep that in mind. That's going to be part of, uh, I mean, we've already more or less established this over the semester. And the other point that she talks about is untellability. Again, we've spoken about this, but why do we talk about these things to begin with? There is, it's not to suggest that all, oh my God, are my eyes closed? Shit. Sorry. I do this even when there's no one in the room. It's not to suggest that, um, uh, all folklore is inherently doing this thing. But we've spoken about the concept of tellability and untellability. When we are dealing with issues that we don't necessarily have some kind of voice for, think about Ellis and the naming uh, and how, how critically important name is to the legend process, that first step in the half-life of the legend. If we don't have the name, if it doesn't exist in some kind of metonymic force already, we don't really have the um, the wherewithal to express things. But more, more than that, so, so we might employ some kind of metaphor that kind of expresses the thing that we're kind of trying to express. And then more than that, we have these issues that they're untellable, not because we don't have a name for it, but because they're a concept of trauma. Because telling them exposes ourselves to potentially to risk. Telling them exposes ourselves potentially to the risk of reliving that moment. And so instead, we tell it, like Gillian Bennett sometimes says, which I think is an Austin quote, we tell it slant. So we employ these metaphors. So when we are looking at things, even as something like, like Slender Man, Slender, Slender Man is the example that she's giving. Even when we talk about these things, we are talking about, um, uh, we, we are often talking about, uh, they stop being stories about some tall skinny dude and they start being stories, um, uh, they start being stories about, uh, sorry, Robert Casey signed into his wife's uh, YouTube account and everyone's embarrassed. Um, what was I saying? Oh, I'm so easily distracted. It stops being a thing about some tall, skinny dude who lives in the internet or is like lurking in the shadows. And it starts to be about lurking. It starts to be about the sense of one being watched. It starts to be about that sort of palpable sensation of... Uh, being subject to intrusion and voyeurism and so on. And we, if we don't really have a language developing to talk about those sorts of concerns, and you can make an argument that even the most highly intelligent, highly socially adept, highly social media savvy um, adolescents don't necessarily have that language for it, uh, the appeal of the story and the passing on of the story might in part be because their actual experience defies tellability. So when we're thinking about these sort of notions of even like what, you know, what constitutes the monster, it's not too big a leap to suggest that it is a metaphor for something, but we're not, but that metaphoricity, the reason why we employ the metaphor might actually be not simply because we want to disguise it, but because disguising it keeps us safe. So there you go. So now on to chapter two. Hooray. And uh, yeah, um, we are in the midst of this. The disease is coming from inside the house where we are trying to establish the patterns of disease. Um, it is a, um, so we're moving from six to seven. Uh, yeah, and Andrea herself on Facebook posted a local article from her um, from her uh, local television station in Greenville, North Carolina, at East Carolina University, where, she, where she's from, with the first where they start to report the first case. And if you, uh, I'll, I'll add this link, but here's just like the uh, her comment on it. Um, this article where they tell us about our first case, effectively making them our patient zero, basically follows chapter two of my book a little too well. I can already see it in the table. So the idea that immediately we are trying to understand. The um, the pathology and the spread of the of the uh, the story of of, of uh, 
coronavirus within particular communities, and we're already using patient zero kind of terminology. And so the thing about the about uh, the, the narratives, uh, outbreak narratives, and the sort of desire for uh, coming up with uh, uh, causes, trying to establish models that explain risk. There's sort of two senses of risks that are going on. But first of all, it's a good to, good to recognize that these stories are, of course, explicitly on the surface about contamination, that they are about the spread of a disease. What I, how do I put it on the slide? The spread of some kind of threat to the human person across geographies and through populations. And that is sort of the discourse that's happening both in the scientific community and in the vernacular community. Um, don't be patient 31, someone in South Korea, I think, who allegedly didn't practice proper social distancing. Oh, that that popped up on Twitter. Yeah, that I, I yeah, and the, 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 everything was going great until that one moment happened, uh, so to speak. Um, so, but at the same time, they are so you know on on a scientific level, on the the epidemi epidemiological level, they are about the spread of contagion and, and how to understand not the not that they use the word contagion. Uh, they are about communicable diseases and how can we uh, <coughs> how can we model how they have spread in order to affect containment and so on. But then they also exist in the vernacular discourse. The vernacular discourse is thinking metaphorically as well, and it speaks to the primary issues that we deal with in urban legend and the reason they were sort of urban to begin with. So what did I say? They are simultaneously inextricable from metaphorical, from metaphorical contamination. The intrusion of ambivalent categories into the assumed, and by assumed we mean privileged, norm where we have the other, the capital O other, by ethnicity, by nationality, by sexual orientation, whatever, 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 as coterminous with a contaminating agent in and of itself. Uh, and there often tends to sort of be an implicit moral hazard argument. Moral hazard, if you're not familiar with that from sort of, you know, uh, like a basic concept in ethics, in that um, there are behaviors that uh, we, in, it's implicit moral hazard. It's not direct correlation, but it's a good thing to consider that there are behaviors that in theory, uh, some cynical ethicists think that we would do were it not for the fact that there is harm associated with them. So were it not for this sort of thing, we would go wild. So that institutes the idea of punishment. It institutes the idea of kind of the enforcement of negative com uh, negative consequences for particular activities and behavior. You can make an argument that moral hazard is one of the things that we that our entire legal system is based on because we have penalties for things that might not even necessarily be immediately dangerous acts in and of themselves, but they invite that, and therefore we curb them. So parking violations and, and so on that you you are paying a penalty so but for fear of being penalized one obeys that's one of the concepts but the other notion is that the this gets sort of extrapolated onto the other in that were they behaving the way that they ought to behave and we understand the way they ought to behave by the way a sensible pe person like myself behaves they would not have exposed themselves to this so it starts to also associate some kind of blame but it also starts to associate some kind of um rationale some kind of risk behavior that if i don't do that don't do what donnie don't does if i don't do that i will probably be okay so they as much as they are assigning blame they're also tacitly at least suggesting some kind of uh pathway out of it and so next slide we talk about like the appeal of ground zero and patient zero because it starts to introduce a plot we narrativize this and as you said in the last chapter in the introductory chapter one of the things that these narratives do is that they introduce this into something approaching which as she says a type that they have uh, you know the implicit, if we want to talk about sort of Vladimir Propp's morphology of folktale, an implicit stasis 
and then some kind of intrusion that introduces some kind of imbalance, some um, uh, disequilibrium, and then a series of presumed redressive actions that will restore some kind of stasis. And thinking about who the actors are, where the characters are, where the place is, um, helps us frame it this way. And again, these are important things. The, the notion of a kind of a ground zero and the notion of a patient zero works on the epidemiological scale as well because they are required for models, but models and stories aren't necessarily the same fucking thing. So that inter, in, uh, introduces the sort of the complicating action. Uh, so place and inhabitants become interrelated. The, 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 if you could trace a disease, if you trace the outbreak of something to a particular place, that's sound epidemiologically, that's good. We know that we can start to ascribe causes to it, and so on. On that level, on an, on a, an appeal to sort of the, the uh, redressing the issue, but we also start to fundamentally, potentially, stigmatize the place, and we associate the place with the inhabitants, and then we we make a sort of a back and forth that way. So her quote, where it says, uh, "Patient zero not only provides a scapegoat, but also serves as an exa uh, serves as an example to others. As long as people do not act in the same way as patient zero, they are safe." Uh, and she uses the expression on the next slide, "blazon populaire." Uh, and again, I'm pretty sure I've spoken about this, but I don't know if I've ever shoved it up on a slide. Uh, blazon populaire is the fancy folklore term basically for prejudicial statements, beliefs. It's one of those things where we would list them and we'd probably list them as statements or dirty jokes or whatever, uh, ethnic jokes, whatever. Um, but, you know, behind them is really the the understanding, the cultural esoteric understanding of what that of how that group operates uh, in order to make sense of the expression in order to make sense of the tale in order to make sense uh, make sense of the joke again they kind of function much way uh, much like in the uh, traditum They're, they become these examples of traditum as well where we don't necessarily believe them to be operative but we are fluent with them and they can go from being mere fluent to actually how we are informing judgment very quickly. So uh, they they move back and forth. It's one of the reasons why legend and joke are so closely associated is that they both pool, uh, draw from the same pool of shared resources. You want to think of things like uh, a, a kind of a banally stigmatized group uh, like redheads, for example, you know the, all the sort of jokes about redheads and you know, not having souls and so on. I truly don't think anyone necessarily believes that. I really hope that you don't. On the other hand, you are fluent enough that you can make those jokes easily when they occur, or at least understand those jokes. And again, understanding the jokes doesn't necessarily mean that you find them funny, but at least you find them comprehensible. You're like, ah, yeah, that's not cool, dude, is a perfect is a perfect answer to that. But the, uh, uh, means that you do not necessarily get those terms of references. So again, thinking about like Buckin's article on Pet Chow, which is a great example of this, the, um, the uh, switch between uh, a motifed tradatum notion of what how these people are and how it becomes operative uh, in in uh, uh, how it become operative when it becomes threatening when when it becomes something that we are necessarily thinking of. Brian just said it is so weird to me that we can see this idea of ground zero and the idea of a scapegoat happening right now in the world. Trump calling COVID nineteen the China virus is the perfect example. Exactly, that's the perfect example. Give me a second for my uh, my delicious, delicious one pleasure left in life. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and branding it that way, and now you have, fortunately, in this uh, you know, Twitter sphere, you all you immediately have the people who are taking that to task, and you are pointing out sort of the counter examples. And what, like the idea of the Spanish flu seems to be one that's floating around, and um, that I have seen and. Remember, I'm not an expert in the history of epidemics, so 
I am probably as well versed in some of this as you are, but uh, the Spanish flu example came up and then, well, Spain didn't complain about when we called the Spanish flu of 1918, 1919, the Spanish flu. And first of all, yeah, they did. And second of all, that isn't even where it came from. That's where it was first reported because they had a freer press in the, at the time than, uh, than in many other countries. So they started recording, there is this very exceptional flu that, that seems to have struck and that the name became associated with there. But the first cases were actually American cases. Um, yeah, the picture that, uh, that Trump has about where he crossed out the word Corona and replaced the word China in Sharpie, go, go for it. So um, patient zero and super spreaders work the same kind of way because if ground zero is about place and the stigmatizing movement, you're trying to also establish, well, how it goes from this foreign other, that, well, this land far away, that this, this place of danger that is really s defined first and foremost by being not here and then second by whatever thunderous uh cascade of motifs that you put across or put upon this particular place through Blaison Populaire, through Tatitum and so on. And so it's like, oh, it's not simply not in Cape Breton, it is in China. And so we all the prejudices that we have about this particular place come to the fore. Or it's in Africa, you know, the great Undistinguished, indistinguished, sorry, indistinguished Africa, where we just sort of lump the entire continent in one thing. So think about Diane's article on um, on the uh, uh, AIDS legends um, that we read earlier, in terms of you know the, the the North American Euro consciousness that tends to think of Africa as just one place as opposed to a continent much larger than North America with 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 regions associated with it but once we hear ebola that's a river in africa it's like gorsh and then all the prejudices none of which are cool uh come to the fore so um the but the idea so that's the place but the patient zero and the super spreaders come through with um come through by uh now associating one of the people either of that place or someone who through uh circumstances uh, expose themselves to the uh, the communicable disease, expose themselves to uh, uh, contamination, and then become contaminators themselves, spread the disease through whatever, taking it first and foremost, taking it from its point of origin to other places. It's moving through space. Um, I'm just thinking about movement and patterns and uh rites of passage and so on i there might be something there might be something there but let's just put a pin in that idea for a while uh so but you know it means because it's all based on the how does it get from there to here because these stories are told from here these stories are told uh you know in the the grand swell of history you know hence now if that's a word, uh, you know, we, we'll have the, the benefit of trying to understand these things as patterns. But again, legend emerges in the moments of uncertainty when we are trying to sort out of all the particular sources, what is the one that is the most urgent communication that we need to fundamentally, A, pass on to those near and dear to us, and B, orient our behavior uh, around how do I protect myself from those that I love, and there, so that's that process of trying to come to an understanding. And when that understanding is built on um, emergent data, uh, let alone biased data, but just you know fragmentary mixed messages, we we reconstruct, we fill in the holes in that narrative. Uh, this is not new, but uh, but there you go. So uh, the stigmatized community, she, she gives many examples. And that's that lovely chart, which I'll refer you to. You don't necessarily, I'm not going to cover it, but things like typhoid Mary. So first you have the stigmatized population of the Irish and the Irish as working class servants in 19th and early 20th century America. Uh, plus the idea, but this is that different issue in terms of, uh, well, they might be the stigmatized population. Uh, amongst us cool Protestants. Uh, but over on top of that, you also have the 
uh, the notion that, well, they are here to do work that rightly you, housewife, should be doing yourself. So the fact that she is a cook is not incidental to the Typhoid Mary narrative, let alone the idea that she's, I mean, this isn't even a capitalist narrative, but you could certainly put an interesting capitalist uh, critique on this, or I guess a Marxist critique, technically, of the capitalism in that she is told not to work in there, but has no other means to work. So what is the nature of society? How do What do we owe each other? But I don't think Typhoid Mary necessarily gets taken all the way over to that Marxist critique too often. It still basically speaks about danger. Andrea Keita is, is uh, communicating to me. Does she have a question? Uh, buh, 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 buh. I don't know. I wish I could watch it, but I have a meeting that I have to be attending because it's about going up for full. Hooray. Message from Andrea. Um, I should turn that off. There we go. So uh, as it moves through the population, you have these sort of stigmatized population. You have these stigmatized uh, groups that are bringing it towards Gaetan Duga, patient zero for for uh, AIDS, HIV, uh, and the issue of traveling. I think that's where you start to see it are moving away from a pure stigmatized population of the um, of uh, you know the the people who are not us who are coming towards us. But then you have people like. Like Etienne Dugas. I mean, he's French Canadian, so it might for maybe for an, for a uh, Anglo American context they were othered, but fundamentally it was about moving from places of safety to places of danger and traveling back and forth. Uh, he was a he was a air steward, and again in a ridiculously uh, homophobic heteronormative uh, culture, even that the idea of a male stewardess was enough of a stigmatizing category that, that he brings that to it as well. Um, and then you have the notion of uh, the border. And, and so you're not even talking about individual groups and uh, individuals from groups. You are now talking about entire groups and that kind of metaphor that starts to, uh, to, 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 to come forward. Again, the notion of contagion, the notion of a dangerous agent that's coming through. So, um, whether you are talking about sort of a specific stigmatized population in terms of like uh, naming an identity, whatever nationality you, you, you wish to, to bring in, or even just the undifferentiated specific blazon populaire that we have with foreigner, you know, with, with outsider. So all y'all, uh, you have that kind of aspect. And then you have, if travel is already now a stigmatized thing, you know, why would you ever want to leave home? And you get that an awful lot. Uh, I told you, right, that I was watching, that I was uh, talking to someone. I'm not going to put it on YouTube now because they, I don't know, they could possibly come. But someone was, and this was coming out, like late January, early February, when these stories were just starting to percolate and people were just starting to get on the cruise ships or be not, not getting off the cruise ships. Uh, and um, the, sort of the idea of like, ah, oh, the cruise ship passenger, where are you expecting? Or is it kind of a, the kind of the idea of, again, like a moral hazard argument, but also, uh, well, they're cruise ship people. They are uh, beneath us, which is a little bit weird considering how much our Sydney local economy is based on cruise ships coming in. Um, but then it basically, then there's sort of a double twist, almost a sort of Levi Straussian double twist, where you have the entire population is stigmatized by uh, uh, and pathologize that, that the immigrant becomes disease. Uh, so not simply as harbinger of disease, but comes by disease. So an interesting thing, which I came across just yesterday, and this is on slide 12, uh, where you have these two, these two issues. Um, uh, remember this four years ago, Donald Trump Jr. He, uh, tw he uh, retweeted a sort of a classic meme. It's a meme that's based on uh, a piece of uh, anti-Semitic Nazi children's literature from the 1930s, where Jews were being compared to uh, po poisonous mushrooms, and that you you know they they look fine but you should avoid them because they are poisonous. They look like us, but they are dangerous. And that motif of, you know, just avoid them all because of this, the association of that, it became associated with the refugee problem. And so you have, uh, as you see on slide 12, the image, if I had a bowl of Skittles and I told you three would kill you, would you take a handful? That's our Syrian refugee problem. So what a, what a charming and good citizen he is. Um, but now, in the past couple of days, you have that same meme associated with COVID, and you as as a means of 
um, as a means of protection. So you have that one. The death rate for COVID-19 is only 2%. If you have 100 Skittles, but two will kill you, would you chance it? And I first came across this, of all things, it wasn't on some weird anti-immigrant site, because I don't follow those. But um, a friend of mine who's a paramedic, and it's like, you know, this is a paramedic team. So they're using that same kind of thing. So it's interesting, the the relationship between danger and then taking something as calm and cool as a Skittle as the example. And then Skittle, weirdly enough, leads us to talking about Disney. So uh, the Disney becomes sort of the, 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 the final chapter because Disney is almost antithetical to the idea of otherness. Obviously, it's the most magic place on earth, but it isn't the most foreign place on earth. It's associated with whiteness. It's associated with hardcore mainstream American values. It's associated with safety. It's associated with all the fundamental positive attributes. And it's travel, but it's American travel, and it's travel to a place that looks an awful lot like America, and is meant to be America at its ideal, and then it becomes a place of danger. So you can't, uh, she you know, does the same narratives, uh, the, the same table as she was doing with the patient zero and the ground zero narratives. Um, but, you know, they don't quite work because everyone seems to be white. There might be some kind of tourist, but everyone seems to be white. Then it becomes associated with yet another stigmatized population. It becomes associated basically with sort of like Whole Foods mobs. It becomes associated with the anti-vaxxer movement. And that seems to be the issue. But as she sort of cl concludes towards the end, the monstrous hybrid is it. I mean, we are now no longer dealing with an other that we can recognize as an other. We are fundamentally dealing with a danger that is... Uh, indistinguishable from the ideal, from from the ideal norm, as it were, middle class, educated, uh, self sufficient, privileged people. It's one thing when the monster is someone othered by as many dimensions as you can. Ah, la la. I will never be like that. Um, you know, I'm talking about some subjectivity and so on. Uh, I will never be like that. It's a quite another thing when it's uh, uh, going forward. Hey, Shandra, and hey, Lynn McNeil is here. Cool. She wrote our textbook from last semester, for those of you who've taken that course. Um, so, yeah. So, there you go. And then the last slide, or the penultimate slide. No, oh, I didn't do that next week on, on, uh, on the channel. Last slide uh, is a story that came out in the LA Times yesterday. Uh, Glendora man, 34, dies of coronavirus infection after visiting Disney World, sources say. So, yeah, we have come this sort of remarkably full circle in that we now have Disneyland stories associated, sorry, Disney World stories associated uh, with uh, with everything. Oh, great. Like, you know, all my uh, folklore crushes are now uh, in on this as well. Uh, I posted this thing on Facebook so people can come in. But anyway, if you have questions for Lynn McNeil or Kim Stryker, you could also go in. Andrea's at a meeting, as I showed you. So um, if you have questions, start typing them now. Um, and again, we can always sort of do a little bit more. I'm going to sort of, I don't know what I'm going to do, stare into the distance for a few seconds while people can add things if they so desire. I'm just going to sort of uh, uh, hang around for a bit. This is the this is the part that I uh, have no guidance about, and uh, I'm making up on the fly. But uh, if I see the comments, I tend to read them. I see Kima's one of the last ones. Just in general, governments blame for a lot of wrong within a country. So if things are getting out of hand. It is a self-saving method to find an other outside us to blame. Yeah, um, it is, and but it's also a self-saving method for yeah you know, the government to find someone outside ourselves to blame. If that's what you mean, so both official when official sources are doing it, as well as vernacular sources, and you have that um, reinforcement fundamentally, and it, certainly in a population that's and you know systems of governance where you are dealing as much with trying to be part of the general narrative as opposed to like the CDC. You know the the government the institutions that don't change and fundamentally are hopefully aiming at actually sort of objective understanding as opposed to uh, being on top of the narrative. Uh, that's a uh, that's a everything. I'm not going to dance for you, and I'm not going to and I'm not going to uh, ad lib. I am ad libbing. The whole thing is ad libbed. I haven't read a book. I can't read. You know that. Um, 
let's see. Uh, the Charles Bukowski puzzle is still being done, I'm sure. Uh, uh, or Wazowski, sorry. Charles, Bu Charles Bukowski, that would be an interesting uh, theme for a, uh, uh, a quarantine jigsaw puzzle. Uh, I'm going to sip another cup of coffee, and I'm going to, uh, I don't know how else I'm going to ad lib. Uh, I can show you, uh, hey, uh, I'm not encouraging people to buy me gifts, but here is a gift a student gave me from, uh, I think this was from Germany. This was neat. Uh, la, 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 la. Just showing stuff. Oh, hi, Andrea. Andrea here. Yeah. Um, Andrea is like right in the chat. So if you have a question for Andrea right now, you could uh, potentially ask her. Uh, she knows this stuff better than I do. Kima, hey, it seems the internal hybrid that looks like us, talks like us, would instigate greater fear than the other as contagion. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's it. Ultimately, and that, that's the sort of the idea of the inside the house, that if you have this notion of what is now expressly close to us as being normatively safe, um, when it when the places that we define as safe are themselves fractured, are themselves violated, um, what is the end point? We don't have those 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 bases. Well, I was typing up these notes, and I think somewhere in in here I use the word cosmopolis, which is a word I like to use because we sometimes think of like you know the the metropolis and so on. And I was trying to sort of dance around this issue of of urban legend. Because you know, we've spoken about why urban isn't the term, because it's about contemporary. But I think there is something, urban might not be the best term, but uh, um, but uh, suburban, but uh, the, 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 the polis of it, I think, might be the cosmopolitan aspect of it. Because it is about uh, heretofore uh, differentiated groups coming together in something that is meant to be a non-differentiated. Um, and so how do you go through that process of trying to figure things out? So the safety issue is, I think, kind of key. What are, What is the new normal? But when the new normal is that no one is as they seem, that becomes fundamentally dangerous. Um, Annabelle, on the monsters inside the house, I keep seeing lots of memes about getting coronavirus from Chinese food. You don't want to stop eating it, but you also have started associating Chinese food with a way to catch the disease. Yeah, there's I, similarly, there was the thing about uh, people are not eating Chinese food, but try getting them to not eat Italian food when the Italian outbreak happens. Um, spreading the virus one order of egg rolls at a time. Um, uh, Lynn, in times of stress, we start subdividing. Us get smaller and more specific. Ooh, good point. And Kim, did you discuss the Mother Earth people who are posting things explaining this virus as a response from the planet to shake us off, punish us, clean house? I haven't, but there is a, the, yeah, that's a thing. I'm not doing a huge amount because hopefully people are going to be talking about these in their papers, Kim. But uh, that's, I think, one of the aspects as well, that that uh, you have um, uh, the, the, the notion of sort of a divine retribution. Again, the, the moral hazard, this is what you get. And you also have the counter to that, or, or at least a parallel to that, is that, no, the sickness isn't people, the sickness isn't Mother Earth, but the sickness is capitalism. And that once you just like turn this off, turn off this tap, all of a sudden, you know, the pollution are down, dolphins are swimming through Venice, for God's sakes. That's kind of cool. So then you have two different moral hazard arguments that are going forward. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Interesting. Earth's vaccine is our virus. Uh, that was Brian. Kima saying, oh, yes, like we are a virus the Earth is fighting off. Andrea, oh, yeah, that's a thing. Kima, COVID-19 is antibodies. Kim Stryker, you're welcome for the idea, students. Yeah. And that's the plot of The Kingsman. Yes, it was the plot of a bad movie by M. Night. Uh, the Happening? That's the plants doing it, but... Uh, Anyway, I don't think that was the plot of uh, Unbreakable. Unbreakable was awesome. Um, cool. Uh, I'm going to sip some more coffee and see what happens. I like how this whole conversation has been hijacked by uh, by Folkies. Um, I don't know if how students are dealing with isolation, but you should hang out in academic uh, social media circles with faculty. They are losing their fucking minds. And it's like, I don't have the validation of sitting in front of a classroom. Yeah, I'm talking to you two as well. You three, you four, however many of my uh, peers are around here. Uh, just very quickly, go back. Uh, Shandra, uh, I did get a message from you. Yeah, no problem. And okay. Uh, yes, Unbreakable, that's it. 
so anyway, I don't know if the chat exists when, I mean, the, I, when I post this up, the chat will still be there. So you'll be able to sort of follow along. Maybe it does something fancy, like crawls up the screen instead. Um, that's cool, but it'll still be here. And I will do an edited version that has the slides back and forth uh, to a certain extent. Uh, and the slides will be available. And, uh, and uh, we'll see what happens at this point. Um, I am now at, I'm at 56 minutes and I know I started like 15 minutes earlier, but I said I would try to keep this to uh, 30 minutes, 45 minutes max. Uh, Cause you, this fun live now, but for students who want to come and like watch it afterwards, if they see like an hour of just this, yeah, I don't think so. Uh, and also, you know, I have, I have to socially distance move myself from my office to my house sometime today. And I want to get this all done beforehand. Um, so, uh, if you have any other comments, you can send them to me. Uh, maybe uh, I'll post some kind of little forum thing. Um, uh, so people can make, make comments as we, uh, uh, in, in addition to this, um, we'll be figuring this out. Whatever I put up on Moodle will make sense. Let me just figure out what I'm going to do. Otherwise, it's uh, it's on. Uh, we're going to uh, next week because I probably won't have to explain assignments and talk about what happened last week. Uh, you know the, the last things of last week. And we're going to be talking about uh, Slender Man. Maybe uh, maybe Andrea and uh, Lynn will join us again. Lynn uh, co-edited the uh, Slender Man. Slender Man is watching you. Is that the name of the book itself? A collection of Slender Man uh, uh, essays that came out. Uh, a couple of, uh, uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, based on a special issue that we did. Is it here? Is this the Slender Man special issue? Nope, that's not. It's probably one over, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to watch you watch me look at books. Um, so yeah, so read the Slender Man one. And again, reminder if, because I think I talked about this did I not talk about this early in the video? If you have, uh, if you didn't get a um, passing grade on the midterm, you uh, submit questions or comments ahead of time. So read the thing, send me some comments and so on. And for each chapter, you like with a day or two before all the due dates are there. If you didn't pass the, if you didn't fail the midterm, you, you can't submit. This is just, just extra credit. And uh, get it ahead ahead of time, and you can slowly, you know, be doing that, helping me help you. Because if this live chat thing hadn't worked, I'd just be riffing. But now I have these questions back and forth. Um, oh, has anyone heard that there might be a case of COVID nineteen at the regional hospital? Um, yeah. Oh, Brian and Lynn are talking to each other. Oh, that's very sweet. I hadn't heard about uh, that. Uh, that's a rumor. I mean, and not, and I'm not saying that is a uh, negative thing. That is an interesting story that's developing. Keep on top of it. So, extra credit is there for people who need a couple of more marks. Uh, it's, and it starts for, and it's for the next four readings, which are the next four classes. Uh, so, Monday, chapter three. Be well. The the people who are near you, keep them near you, and everyone else stay at least six feet away. Um, Bye. I'm going to end this. Oh, wait. Honestly, feeling a little starstruck by all folklorists. Oh, that's so very sweet. Yeah. Um, keep your fan crushes to yourselves. I'm ending the stream. Oh, oh. Heard there a couple of presumptive cases in Glace Bay. Couldn't find the source. Guys, we're all in this together. Nova Scotia stopped sharing counties with the virus. Ugh, gotta love it. I'm just going with let's assume Sydney has at least one case. Well, that's a happy thought for Friday afternoon, Annabelle. Um, I'm going to go, I'm going to give you all 30 seconds to say goodbye to Le uh, to Lynn. Oh, Lynn's just said bye all. Um, COVID first hit Canada in Markham, where she or where Charlotte is now. So there's lots of rumors here about various locations around town that could be contaminated. Bye. Uh, bye. Wow. Okay. Well, this conversation can continue in the live stream on Monday. See you there, 2.30. Well, you see me, you'll see this bookcase at about 2.25, and then I'll show up at 2.30. And let's just let the good times roll. Uh, be well, everybody. I'm ending stream. Bye.